it's not social order, which is patriarchal. Uh, 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 um, and she talked about the Purusha Sutta and the Rig Veda. Um, well, what, what I had always noticed, actually, till, till, till uh, I, I, I just heard caution, um, is that what is, described, what is being described? The creation of the world through the sacrifice of the Purusha, who is the first sacrificial victim. As the sacrifice is made, from the different body parts of this Purusha sacrificial victim, different social classes are born. They emerge from his head, from his arms, from his thighs, and from his feet. And so what has always struck me about this image is that social order is being naturalized. When the world is created, it is already always created with a certain social order inscribed into it. The birth of the world is already the birth of society itself. There's no conception of a prior natural state of equality or chaos or anything like this. The classification is co-emergent with the very creation of the world as such. Right? So there's a naturalizing of the social order. It is cosmogonic. Creation of the world is already an ordered world. And it's already a hierarchical world. It's already an unequal world. It's already a divided world in this in this fourfold way. Right? So that's a very powerful image. And then it is anthropo anthropomorphized. That is to say, the icon or the diagram of society is also the diagram of the human body. Now, what Gaushal is pointing out is to say, why is this body a male body? When our entire experience across species of actual birth is that the woman gives birth. It is a mother who produces a progeny. So why is the world or why is our social order the progeny of a male figure? That's an interesting point. I hadn't actually thought about it like that. Ambedkar puts this in a very different way. He says, you only really get this idea of a vertical hierarchy from upper to lower, from top to bottom, from head to foot. If you consider that this figure is standing up, the Purusha is standing up, that's when you say the head is above the feet, right? But if it's a sacrificial victim, then it's more likely that he's actually lying down, right? In which case, Ambedkar says, you have a horizontal, egalitarian, flat view of social classes. Why have we never read the image horizontally instead of vertically, right? He, he's, he's trying to basically deconstruct what is essentially a very, very deeply embedded uh, uh, ideologically charged image that we have as a way to, as a shorthand to understand the nature of our society as such. Right? And it has all the problems already available in it. One of inequality and the other of patriarchy. Right? Now you could ask, why, why do we care? This is some old text. Most people have no access to it. They have no understanding of how it works. You know, why don't we simply discard it and forget it and move on? Right? But we all know that that's not how societies work. Texts have real effects. They have truth effects. Ideologies impact the way in which we live our lives. And therefore, we have to deal with what is in these texts. Now, I just want to say, and this is, I, I speak, I think, for Kaushal also, uh, who I've been talking to uh, over the last few days, and for, for Mandha Krantaji. See, we all, we belong to different generations, uh, Mandha Krantaji and the two of us. We are all from different parts of the country. So our, our native languages are all different. She speaks Bengali, uh, Kaushal is from Haryana, I speak Hindi and Punjabi. Um, you know, uh, we, 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 we are all Indians, we are all Indian women, but we, perhaps we have very little in common 
in terms of our social experience, in terms of our background. Now, when I started, when Kaushal started studying Sanskrit, I mean, she describes, she tells a very interesting story and it's widely available about the accidental nature of her introduction to Sanskrit. And then, of course, the problems that she faced as she tried to advance further and further, higher and higher in her education, social problems that she encountered. Now, somebody like me, you would think, would not encounter those problems. But I also encountered problems, right? Which may not have had to do with my caste, but certainly had to do with my gender when I tried to go and read in more traditional or orthodox or religious environments like Mathas or Peters or Pachalas, uh, where uh, women were simply not seen, leave aside women from different parts of the country of uncertain Jati status and so on. So uh, all of us had a variety of experiences where we were told basically, fundamentally, that you're not really supposed to be here. And you're not really allowed to do this. Right? And nonetheless, for our various different reasons and in our different ways, we persisted. Now, I used to think, and I want to share this with you, that look, this is, a, this is my obstacle course. If I want to read some text, I want to read the Vridhara Nikopanishad, that let us say I'm very interested in it. I want to read the Bhagavad Gita, or I want to read the Nuansa Sutra, or whatever it is I want to read. I just have to go through this misery of having this door shut and that door closed and this prohibition and that awkwardness of having a fight with my teacher, of leaving this institution, of going far away from home. All these things, these insults, these injuries, these problems I have to, it's part of my dharma as a student. I just have to keep going because in the end I want to know what that text is saying. Right? Until I realized and this is where we come in. I realized that actually no. What I need to understand is those obstacles themselves. That has to be the object of my study. Why is this social structure inhibiting me from accessing the beauty, the power, the truth, the transcendent values, the norms of these texts? Right? This, this is not just merely a set of conditions that I have to overcome. In fact, I need to understand those conditions themselves because those are constitutive of our relationship with that knowledge system, with those texts. There's no such thing as a perfect reading experience, isolated in pristine sort of intimacy with the text. As women, we do not experience that intimacy. As people from different castes, we, we do not have that kind of access. And that's something that, that we all struggle with and that we wanted you know, to share with you today. I have one thing to add. We have all experienced differently, as she says. There is yet another gatekeeping thing that goes in the Sanskrit world that I have experienced, which is what have you studied? Have you studied the Vedas? Have you studied the Vyakaranas? As a student of Natya Shastra, I had to face this obstacle, discrimination. I was told by a Sanskritist that I never thought of you as a Sanskritist because you studied the Natya Shastra. So Bharata was not a Sanskritist. I studied dance literature. That really discriminated. So, in the Sanskritic world, there is more than just the caste and gender. It's what you study, where the, as soon as I said, uh, first of all, my, I'm a student of Smriti and Mimamsa to begin with. Then I changed and I went into Natya Shastra study, the study of Natya Shastra. Nobody took me seriously. I was not a Sanskritist. I do dance. I was introduced to some people that she works on dance. So it was like a Nutty's thing. Mm -hmm. Eventually I got so annoyed about this discrimination, I wrote my book, a book based on Smriti and Smriti Shastra, the women in the Hindu tradition. And then uh, those people who rejected me looked at me, took me seriously, so that's my
outside experience. And what I am saying, nothing has changed and these exclusionary statements have prevailed. And is there going to be any change? She has been working with Ambedkar's vision, texts. It is so profound and it should, we should all look at them. There are so many good things that happen and we should not be discouraged that this gatekeeping uh, is still prevalent and we should make them aware that this is not how it should work. But in the last 50 years, not much has changed. In the university, universities, shudras are, are getting a scheduled SC position in India. Women never got hired in Sanskrit department for many, many years until 88 in Calcutta University and so on. Later they, now there are some. So this kind of discrimination where Shudra, Sri, and on top of that, what you choose to study. That it can get in is also there. Can I just say, uh, it's very interesting, uh, if you look at Sanskrit, so, you all know, I mean, you know, there's different routes to the study of Sanskrit, right? You could study it Indologically, okay. yeah. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, you can, I'm sorry, I haven't finished. No, no. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't finished. No, I just want to ask. I, 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 I it's not really want to ask. Let us complete. Let us complete. Let us complete. No, no, how much time for yeah, discussion? Discussion, we just need to know that, that's all. We just need to know. We are just, we are just going to surprise. Yeah. 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 Yeah.